creator of heaven and earth, the great I am. And we uh, take this time this morning on this first day of the week to worship you and to praise you and to remember our Savior and ask that you uh, hear our prayer today and bless us in all that we do as we ask this prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay, um, so it is a little bit of a different format, and thank you all so much for your patience and bearing with us as we uh, as we kind of navigate this weird time. But but we before all this kind of started, we were talking about the idea of navigating, navigating the heart was the the kind of series that we were in, thinking about the spiritual terrain that we see in Scripture, how the the metaphors of geography. Uh, can sometimes map out the spiritual terrain of our hearts and what's going on um, inside of us. Sometimes it, it can mirror the pictures that we see uh, and read about in scripture. And in, in that, that Navigating the Heart series, we looked at the desert, how the desert can uh, represent those times of spiritual dryness, those times um, when it's possible that God may be leading us through to a place of development and transformation. We looked at the, the idea of the forest and we thought about how in the forest we can go through those times of confusion and disorientation when it can be really hard to find the path that we ought to be walking. In the last one of these lessons, we looked at the, the idea of the valley, those times in life when the, the highways of the heart can dip down into dark places. And we're reminded that even if it might not feel like it, our God is the God of the hills and the valleys, and that there's no place where his hand can't reach. And so today what I want to talk about is the idea of the mountain and what it looks like when we come across a mountain in our lives. And, and if we could, let's, let's have another prayer at this time. Would you join me, please? Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, for this time that you've set aside for us to worship, and, and it's... It's not what we're used to, Father. It, it feels different, and it, it's, it, feels, uh, it feels odd to, to come before you this way, but what a blessing it is to see so many of our brothers and sisters here this morning, Father. Uh, we can't be together, but, but we certainly are together. We are brothers and sisters. We are your adopted children. We are your house. We are Christ's body, and we're so thankful so thankful that that you have called us to be yours we just pray as we continue in this worship service that you'll continue to fill our hearts with your word fill our hearts with your presence fill our hearts with your spirit so that as we go throughout this week whatever mountains we may encounter whatever challenges we might face we know that you are with us that we are not alone that we have those uh brothers and sisters uh who we love and can rely on that we have one another we have you and your word. Thank you for that, Father. Bless us now and always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So when I'm talking about like mountains in life, uh, let's go with kind of a brief definition. I'm talking about anything that stands so large before you that it's hard to see your way around it. And the tricky thing about mountains is that what might be a mountain for me may not be a big deal for you. Maybe, maybe I'll, I'll have something that I'm struggling with, something that's looming large in my life, and you'll, you'll think, well, well, what's the big deal? Why is that a problem? But that's what makes it a mountain. That's what makes everyone have mountains in their lives. It, it's something that we struggle with. It's something that it's so large in our lives, sometimes we have a hard time seeing past it. And I want to kind of paint that picture using four mountains from scripture, four mountains that we read about in the Bible that can kind of help us get an idea of what it is we're talking about. So if you've got your Bibles handy, and I hope you do, open up to the Hebrew letter. Um, the letter to the Hebrews toward the end of your New Testament, that's the letter um, that is about some of the many ways Jesus is better than what the Jews had before. And in Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12, the Hebrew writer is encouraging his readers, which is us, to remember to have faith. 
it's an encouragement to be faithful and to endure those times when we're going through trials, when we're facing hard times in life, because it may be that God is using those times to discipline us, to train us, to see him and to trust him more fully. So in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 18, let's read about the mountains and remember the context is encouragement, encouragement to face trials with faith. This is Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18 from the ESV. You have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them, for they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. And the Hebrew writer is talking about Mount Sinai, that great wilderness peak where God brought his people Israel after he liberated them from slavery in Egypt. God led his people through the desert wilderness to a mountain, an actual geographic place, what the Hebrew writer says, what may be touched. But then look at the description. Blazing fire, darkness, gloom, a tempest, this huge storm, and a voice that spoke such things that the people who heard it begged it, please speak no more. And while this mountain could be touched, that's not a very wise idea, because if even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. The reason for this is that the whole mountain was holy, but that is a fearful declaration, isn't it? You mean we have to kill poor Bessie with rocks just because she went 10 feet higher than us? It's no wonder the people begged that no more messages like that come from the voice. The whole scene was so terrifying that even Moses, the man handpicked by God to lead Israel out of slavery and into freedom, even Moses trembled with fear. So hold that picture of the mountain in your mind, the picture of Mount Sinai that we get in Hebrews 12, and we're going to shift and take a look at a second mountain. We're going to jump ahead about 40 years from when Israel trembled before Mount Sinai, and now we're going to be in Deuteronomy chapter 27. Deuteronomy chapter 27. This is Moses instructing the people on what they are to do once they enter the promised land. Because remember, Moses knows he's not going to go with them. Moses tells the people that when they cross the Jordan River, they're to go over to Mount Ebal. And when they get there, they're to set up these great big stones and they're to cover them with plaster so that they're all smooth and white, this nice blank workspace. And there on those stones at Mount Ebal, they are to write the words of the law on the stones. Then they go up to Mount Ebal and build an altar there. Half of the tribes go up and from Mount Ebal, there they hear the curses that are to come to those who do not obey the voice of the Lord. Curses like, cursed be anyone who moves his neighbor's landmark. A curse on you if you steal your neighbor's land and his children's inheritance. Cursed be anyone who misleads a blind man on the road. How wicked does somebody have to be to trick a blind man on the road? Cursed be anyone who perverts the justice due to the sojourner, the fatherless, the widow. Remember, God always has a special place in his kingdom for the outsider, for the voiceless, for the most vulnerable. And he says a special curse beyond the man who goes out of his way to harm the immigrant, the refugee, the orphans, and the widows. Maybe your mountain is a fearful thing. Maybe the mountain in your life is a place of fire and smoke and storms like Sinai. And maybe your mountain is a temptation to do wrong. Maybe your mountain is a temptation to disregard God's word and his will, a place like Mount Ebal. Mountains like that, they can leave us feeling hopeless. They can leave us feeling small. 
they can leave us feeling like we'll never get past them. So why even try? But remember our definition, what it is that we're calling a mountain in our lives. It's anything that stands so large before you. And that can be our fears and our doubts and our worries. It can be the things that tempt us. It can be our desires. Those things can loom really large before us, and they can be really hard to see around. But the thing is, it's not impossible. And what's really, really amazing and what's really a blessing is that those two mountains, Sinai and Ebal, God has given us examples of their exact opposite. He's shown us different kinds of mountains. Back in Deuteronomy chapter 27, half the people went up Mount Ebal to receive the curses, but the other half of them, they went up Mount Gerizim, and they received the blessings. Mount Gerizim, if you go to Israel, it literally faces Mount Ebal. There's this flat plain that's barely a mile wide between the two mountains. And they're really pretty close to being the same height. And the people who went up on Mount Gerizim, listen to what it is that they heard on that mountain. This is Deuteronomy chapter 28, beginning in verse 2. Deuteronomy 28 and verse 2. All these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. I love that. These blessings will come upon you and overtake you. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of your womb, and the fruit of your ground, and the fruit of your cattle, the increase of your herds, and the young of your flock. Blessed shall be your basket, and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. What happens? What happens when you persevere? And come out on the other side of your temptations. What happens when you listen to the word of the Lord instead of the words of the world? When you listen to the word of the Lord and not just listen, but hear it. And not just hear it, but take it in. Not just take it in, but learn from it and apply it. And not just apply it, but when you live it, then all these blessings will overtake you. Now back in Hebrews chapter 12, where we first looked at that picture of Mount Sinai, the mountain of fear and power and trembling, where even Moses was scared. Hebrews chapter 12, the writer then turns and gives us an alternative picture of Mount Zion. He says, back where we read before, speaking of Mount Sinai, he says, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word, than the blood of Abel. Compare that to the mountain of fire and smoke and fear. Mountains are funny things in Scripture. They can be fearful places, places of curses and terrors, or they can be the site of angels gathered in festival clothes, the place where the assembled saints of Jesus Christ gather in the city of the living God to have blessings overtake them. Mountains are high places. And they can loom so large in our sight that we can struggle to understand what to do with them. But I want to think about the mountains that Jesus faced. Because mountains played a huge, huge part in the landscape of Jesus' ministry. Right at the very beginning of Jesus' work, immediately after his baptism by John in the Jordan, when Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness so that he could be tempted, he went to the Mount of Temptation. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 8, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world <laughs> and their glory. And he said to them, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you 
shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And Jesus stood on the mountain of temptation, and he saw his way to the other side with the help of the word of God. The very next chapter of Matthew's gospel records one of the high watermarks of Jesus' ministry. Matthew chapter 5 gives us the longest and clearest picture of what it was that Jesus taught throughout his time on earth. It's the Sermon on the Mount. Remember, Matthew chapter 4 ends with Jesus going through all Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the gospel message, the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and affliction from among the people. Great crowds of people were following him all over the place. And in Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them. At the very height of his teaching ministry, a mountain was the stage from which Jesus taught us that blessed are the peacemakers, that we are the light of the world and the salt of the earth, that he did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it, and that where our treasure is, there our hearts will be also. But what about the mountain of transfiguration, where Jesus took Peter, James, and John up on a high mountain, and there they were witnesses to the glory of the Lord? Or as Peter himself puts it in Second Peter chapter 1, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very, vo vo very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. Those are all important landmarks in the life and ministry of Jesus, but they're not the last mountain that I'm thinking of. There's a scene in Mark's gospel where Jesus counsels a rich young man in the ways of the kingdom. And Jesus tells his disciples after he goes away, he says, all things are possible with God. And then picking up the story in Mark chapter 10, verse 32, this is Mark chapter 10, they were on the road going up to Jerusalem and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to them, to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. It's that last climb to Jerusalem, that last walk uphill, knowing full well everything that awaited him at the top of that climb. Betrayal, condemnation, mocking and beating, shame and pain and death waited there. Jesus knew what was waiting for him at the top of the mountain. He knew that a cross was waiting there, but he climbed it. He climbed that mountain, he accepted what was coming, and on the other side, on the other side is where we find the empty tomb. There are many mountains in our lives, and they may look different for each and every one of us, and they may give us different challenges, and we may have to struggle uh, our way over it. But we remember Jesus. We remember his last trip up the mountain knowing full well what was coming, 